Chapter 2 The Historical City Before we discuss the specific libertarian municipalist project of reviving the political realm, we must spend a few chapters examining the nature of that realm, to clarify just what we mean when we refer to it. The political realm, it should be understood, has a social context, even an anthropological and historical context, as well as specific traditions that have developed over the centuries. Perhaps most crucially, the political realm must be understood as one of three realms that are endemic to human societies generally. The political realm, the social realm, and the state. The social realm. The social realm, not to be confused with society as a whole, is the private realm, encompassing production and economic life. More anciently, it is also the personal arena of family life, of care and friendship, of self-maintenance and reproduction, and of consanguineal obligation. The existence of family groups as such is constantly across human cultures, despite the disparate forms that societies take. It is in family groups that individuals fraternise in the greatest degree of intimacy. The social realm may thus be demarcated as a cross-cultural phenomenon inherent in human communities. The social realm is by far the oldest of the three realms. From their earliest emergence in prehistory as bands and tribes, human communities were structured around the social realm. Indeed, it constituted the largest part of their societies. At the band, or tribe's core, the social realm was rooted in the domestic world of women. It was complemented by a nascent civil world inhabited by men. But since the civil realm was very limited and the state did not yet exist at all, group life in the earlier societies was virtually coeval with the social realm. In keeping with the familistic nature, band and tribal societies were organised according to the ostensibly natural biological principle of kinship. The blood tie the principle of consanguinity was the shared bond that held a tribe together. All members of a given tribe were said to be related by blood, to be descended from a common ancestor. That common descent was what made them all members of the same tribe. The blood tie did not have to be literal. When necessary, a tribe could willfully expand it beyond actual kinship to the point of fiction. For example, when strangers were co-opted into the tribe, or in the case of intertribal marriages. Such alliances were legitimated by virtue of being pronounced in kinship terms. Still, even if it often had to be stretched, kinship was the customary principle that defined and ideologically undergirded a unitary tribe. Nor was kinship the only natural biological principle around which tribal society was organised. The biological fact of sex marked the various responsibilities of tribal life as either male or female, producing gendered divisions of labour and even of culture. The biological fact of age became still another touchstone for social organisation. Members who had lived longer, especially in pre-literate societies, were honoured as the repositories of a tribe's customs and wisdom, a status that allowed some older members even to claim supernatural powers as shamans. All of these natural principles had large fictional components and were often honoured in the breach. Yet since they were rooted in what seemed to be inalterable biological facts, they bound these communities together. In the earliest communities, these biologistic divisions most likely were not rationales for status and rank, let alone for domination and submission. But subsequently, male culture came to be considered not only different from women's, but of greater value and therefore entitled to dominate it. The elderly's knowledge of tribal wisdom became a warrant for gerontocracy, while kinship became a rationale for belief in the superiority of one tribe over another, giving rise to ethnic chauvinism and racism. Indeed, an antipathetic relationship between different tribes must have been rooted in tribal society nearly from the outset. Tribes often claim for themselves the label the people, in contrast to the members of other tribes, whom they essentially regarded as a different taxonomical order, essentially as non-human. 
This self-identification of a tribe as an effectively distinct species generated a strong ethos of solidarity among its own members. But very often, it also gave rise to a vigorous hostility toward members of other tribes, who putatively constituted a threat. Thus, bands and tribes dealt warily and often hostilely with outsiders. They might consider strangers who intrude on them to be their deceased ancestors and propiate them accordingly. Or they might regard them as spirit beings, or as spirits of the dead, or as malevolent beings who bore ill intentions toward the tribe, and eliminate them accordingly. To be sure, a tribe might also treat a stranger with hospitality, but that benign attitude usually depended upon the tribe's goodwill in their particular case, or upon its traditional canons of behaviour, or upon its need to build support networks through marriage alliances and to gain adult males to act as its warriors. The Rise of the City As their primary means of subsistence, band and tribal societies generally foraged, that is, they hunted animals and gathered vegetation to gain the food, clothing and shelter that supported their existence. Sometimes they engaged in more transient, swidden forms of horticulture, burning forests to create temporary planting areas for garden crops until the fertility of the soil was exhausted. But at the beginning of the Neolithic period, probably in the Middle East between 10,000 and 7,000 BCE, a momentous change occurred. Tribal societies gradually shifted their basic means of subsistence away from food gathering and swidden gardening and toward the cultivation of cereal crops. That is, instead of moving around to obtain food from relatively transient sources, tribes people settled down into stable, even permanent villages and systematically cultivated grain and domesticated animals. This transition to Neolithic culture, to farming and animal husbandry, spread quickly and widely throughout Eurasia and had repercussions in many aspects of social life, transforming tribal society into a new dispensation altogether. Grain, being less perishable than meat and vegetation, supplies of food could now be held in reserve, in storage, which made it possible for some members of the tribe to control the distribution of food supply. A fraction of the members thus became owners of property and ultimately of wealth, giving rise to class formations. Classes, in turn, exacerbated the hierarchical stratifications that had already existed. As large-scale farming, particularly with animal husbandry, emerged, it was largely men's work and its fruits were their property creating patriarchal societies that gave supremacy to men and male values. The priests that replaced shamans, in turn, demanded grain as tribute to the gods and added institutional muscle to their predecessors' less formal and more ephemeral spiritualistic claims. But for our purposes, the most important consequence of the shift to farming was what V. Gordon Child called the Urban Revolution. Some of the village settlements, established by Neolithic farmers, grew larger to become towns, and some of these towns developed further into cities, large, permanent settlements in which the residents did not provide their own food, but depended on grain imported from the countryside. For the residents of these cities, life was structured less around kinship than around residential propinquity and shared vocational activities. People lived alongside each other, without necessarily being kin, ultimately without even knowing each other. In time, an outsider or stranger could join a community in the city simply by living there and bringing his or her labour to it, without having to marry into it or be recruited as a warrior. In fact, from a tribal viewpoint, a city was a place where nearly everyone whom a person encountered might well be a stranger. To be sure, Within early cities, as in cities today, many people who were related to one another by clan affiliation chose to live in the same neighbourhoods as their kin, or as a result of ethnic discrimination, were forced to do so regardless of their will. But the crucial point is that slowly, as city living became a way of life, kinship ties diminished as a principle of social organisation and gave way to new ones. Lacking a shared ethnicity, people who were living side by side gradually came to see each other, not through the prism of tribal membership, 
but through the prisms of residence and vocation, status and property, as craftspeople or wealthy vendors, as nobles or priests. Regardless of the specific category, the particularistic fetters that had locked people's forebears into tribal parochialism and intertribal feuds had been loosened. No longer were people of a shared genealogical background constrained to think of themselves as the human beings, and others as real or potentially hostile strangers. Ethnic prejudices persisted, to be sure, but in ever more diluted form than in tribal times, when ethnic difference alone could be a license even to murder an outsider. The new social order transformed people from tribal folk into heterogeneous and potentially cosmopolitan city dwellers. The city, in effect, nudged aside genealogy in favour of a more ecumenical humanitas, or common humanity, as a basic principle of social organisation and initiated the momentous process of creating human universality. As such, the transition to city life was as revolutionary as the agricultural revolution had been and as several millennia later, the industrial revolution would prove to be. The emergence of the political realm To be sure, these heterogeneous cities were anything but egalitarian paradises. On the contrary, the social relations that first replaced kinship were based on status groups, classes and military and religious hierarchies, as well as gender stratification. Ruling elites dominated the ordinary people who laboured to provide them with goods as well as mandatory military service. Priesthoods gained vast powers as a result of the era's ignorance of natural phenomena. Early cities were often temple cities, nor were cities any more tribes immune to brutal periods of warfare. Despite these tyrannies, the urban revolution opened to history the starting possibility that free and egalitarian communities could also exist and that people, once they recognised their common humanity, could order themselves according to rational and ethical standards. The rise of the city, in effect, inaugurated the development of the political realm. It was the existence of shared concerns and public spaces held in common by inter-ethnic communities in the city that made this development possible. Once they passed outside the walls of their private homes, that is, once they left the social realm, the stranger-residence of a city entered streets, squares, commons and places of public accommodation, all of them places where they could interact with one another. Here, buying and selling took place, and here also men and women could socialise, they could exchange news of general interest and discuss common concerns. The surface of walls could become places for public announcements and news. Pageants and religious festivals could line the streets. Thus, public spaces came into being of the city, spaces that could potentially be set aside for civic purposes and political activity. The Athenian polis made the earliest leap of transforming such public spaces into political arenas. Despite the persistence of ethnic fictions, slavery and gender domination there, the polis defined and concretized the political realm as the arena of direct democratic self-management. It also opened the historical possibility for political freedom, that is, the positive freedom of a community as a whole, with which individual liberties are tightly interwoven. We will have more to say about the polis presently. Suffice it to observe here that after its demise, direct democracy was submerged by the Alexandrian and Roman empires. Some of its features were appropriated for imperial propaganda, but its substance as a self-conscious program was all but destroyed. Centuries after the fall of Rome, however, the idea of civic freedom was revived when a number of towns in the Po Valley and Flanders began to seek local autonomy from their ecclesiastical and temporal masters. These medieval communes shortly demanded civic liberties, including freedoms to make their own laws and create their own secular courts and forms of civic administration. As in the Athenian polis, Citizens in these communes came to manage their affairs according to their own secular criteria, not those of the elites that would rule them. 
In so doing, they revived the Hellenic tradition of the city as a locus of self-management and freedom. Embedded in an authoritarian feudal society, it is no wonder that one medieval Germanic adage had it, quote, city air makes free, unquote. Stadluft macht frei. By no means, of course, did social inequality and ethnic hostility vanish with the rise of the political realm, any more than it had vanished with the rise of the city. From ancient times to the present, political elites have exercised authority over political life, even legitimating their rule by quasi-tribalistic claims to ancient noble ancestry. In ancient Athens, as we have already seen, the polis was poisoned by slavery, patriarchalism, class rule, and imperialism. As for the medieval communes, even the most democratic were partly oligarchical, based on the rule of patrician merchants, as well as master artisans. They were quasi-republics rather than democracies. The New England towns, another important chapter in the history of direct democracy, initially excluded non-church members from their town meetings, not to speak of women. Moreover, the white free men who populated these democratic meetings captured Indians and sold them into chattel slavery. Even during the most radical and democratic periods of the French Revolution, the assemblies of Paris were rife with xenophobic fears of foreign conspiracies. Yet many of these failings were characteristic not merely of a given democratic moment in history, but of the entire era of which it was part. Looking back from a distance of 2,400 years, we may now judge patriarchy and slavery to be repellent and inhuman, but Athens could hardly be expected to have risen above those basic features of ancient Mediterranean society as a whole. What is remarkable is that it did rise above monarchical authority and repressive custom, which were also typical of that Mediterranean world, and innovate a new political realm. Even as municipal democracies throughout history were mired in the hierarchical features of their eras, their liberatory moments sustained and furthered the tradition of direct democracy against ever greater odds. It is to these emancipatory moments that we now turn.